Uh, well, thank you all so much for having me here today. My name is Jeff Alamy. I'm the Director of Conservation Technology at the Chesapeake Conservancy. Um, starting about three years ago, we started to really uh, move into the world of high-resolution data. And thanks to the encouragement efforts of Peter Claggett and Rich Patoka of the Chesapeake Bay Program, um, they wanted to see how this data could help uh, be spread throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed and help improve some of the modeling that's being done. Um, so we put together a big project, uh, put together a collaborative uh, of different organizations working on it to basically divide up the 100,000 or so square miles of counties that make up the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, we wanted to do full county, so it was useful for them as well. Um, and worked with a number of different contractors. So the Chesapeake Conservancy's Conservation Innovation Center uh, produced land cover in Maryland, uh, D.C., West Virginia, and New York counties. Uh, University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab, um, who was already doing some tree canopy work in Pennsylvania and Delaware, uh, expanded their work to do all of the classification, uh, the, all of the classes that we were looking at. And Worldview Solutions uh, was contracted by Virginia DEQ to do the Virginia counties. Um, so well, over about an 18-month period, all of our teams slaved away at our computers and turned one meter resolution NEAP imagery, the National Agricultural Imagery Program, um, into a high resolution land cover data set that spans all of the counties in the Chesapeake Bay uh, watershed. Um, just a couple points on this as well is that uh, Virginia actually produced data for the entire state of Virginia, um, initially in the watershed and then also outside the watershed counties. Um, and Pennsylvania, University of Vermont had a contract from the William Penn Foundation to do the Delaware River watershed counties and recently was awarded a contract to do the western Pennsylvania counties that weren't included. So Pennsylvania will have a statewide data set. Uh, Maryland, Delaware, obviously every county touches the watershed, so they have complete coverage. So we will have statewide coverage in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, D.C., and Virginia um, coming out of that. One of the big things that uh, has come out of this is previously, and Peter mentioned this a little bit, other, other uh, people have mentioned this, the land cover that was used in previous data sets was 30 meter national land cover data set. Um, this is a really great data set for a number of reasons. One is you can model across the entire watershed. You also have a time series going back in time so you can look at change and trends in watersheds across that time period. One of the challenges that we really saw with this data though and heard from a number of our partners was while it worked really well for modeling at the watershed scale and getting down to a sub-watershed scale in terms of prioritization, it didn't necessarily have the information our local partners needed to help identify where to implement projects to address those restoration goals. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this is downtown Washington, D.C. with the 30 meter data. Looking at it with that one meter data, you can really see it come in and provide that detail down to a level where you can start to see those individual trees. Um, you know, it's it really giving you an idea of where buildings are, where roads are, where other flat impervious surfaces are. And we have this data that allows you to focus in on individual projects or individual fields for the entire area. So it removes kind of that constraint of being able to model or do work at the entire watershed scale, but you can zoom all the way into an individual field scale using the same data so there's no translation across that. Now this data is, you know, the goal of it uh, was to inform management goals across the Chesapeake Bay programs. Uh, efforts. So looking at fisheries, we actually um, are working with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center who are updating some of their river herring and alewife spawning habitat models using this. Um, they're really interested because tree canopy over streams is one of the biggest determinants of where ha spawning habitat is. So having this resolution, being able to see where you have trees or not, allows you to really hone in and refine where those models are. So they're really interested in that. Looking at vital habitats, you know, what we're able to do is, while we're not getting down to the habitat level with the data, this is allowing you to be able to inform other models, be able to use some of the 30 meter resolution data, um, habitat modeling that people like the Nature Conservancy have been doing for the region to be able to um, refine that land cover down and get a more precise impact to it. Water quality, um, I'll talk about some of the work that we're doing to improve some of the modeling to how you identify projects that will have uh, perhaps larger than anticipated benefit or larger than average benefit for water quality benefits. Um, and really across all of these different goals, you know, there's a role that this data can provide. One of the most interesting things that we've seen is people love to see their house. You know, they love to see their property and be able to understand 
that this data matches up with their understanding of it. Where sometimes when you're working with 30 meter or 90 meter data, it's a little bit too abstract and too pixelated for someone to really, you know, connect with that. Um, but you can show this information. People can zoom into their house. They can see the trees that they planted when they moved in there that have now grown up to be somewhat mature. Um, so it's really a good engagement tool. Um, and as we work more with farmers and with landowners, being able to show them a map that they can connect with on a personal level really just starts a conversation from a different point versus having them try to extrapolate their understanding of the landscape to what they're seeing in the data. There are, uh, there's a significance for a lot of things for different Bay program management efforts. Um, first and foremost is that this data is being incorporated into the basics models. Um, Peter uh, has been doing a lot of great work in terms of translating this one meter land cover data into a land use land cover data set um, and aggregating it up to a series of 10 meter resolution uh, raster layers that will be incorporated into the modeling efforts. Um, what it also provides us with is a baseline for watershed-wide tracking. So we can look and see um, with updates to the data down the road, um, we're still discussing what the right time frame is in terms of how frequently you update it or do you need to do a wall-to-wall -wall update versus just uh, assessing change and updating small areas. But it allows you to see things like where you have changes you know, very precisely of impervious surfaces, where you're losing trees, where you're losing um, farm fields, stuff like that. Um, getting down into uh, more coastal issues, looking at wetland loss, um, because we're using the aerial imagery um, combined with LiDAR where we have it um, for that full point cloud, you can start to get a fairly detailed estimate of the boundaries of where wetlands are and looking and seeing where you have <coughs> things like ponding in the middle of a wetland. That may be an indicator of wetland collapse before you have that erosion coming in. Um, one of the big things with this is it also increases the resolution of all of your management efforts. So where tracking change on a 30 meter pixel, you know, that's a, a fair amount of change that needs to occur, um, especially in small like coastline issues. Um, that one meter resolution allows you to see much finer scale changes that if you're talking about things like climate change, you're not having a drastic amount of change over a very short time period. So having that finer unit of analysis allows you to potentially see some of those trends before it's too late or before it's too big. Um, one of the other really cool things about this project is that we uh, engage local governments through a review process. So we talked and gave every local government the opportunity to see the data, comment on the data. If they had data sets that they wanted to be included, um, we had a conversation with them about that. Uh, a lot of local governments have paid for a digitized planimetric data set, mapping out all of their impervious surfaces. Um, one of the things that we were able to do was be able to incorporate that data where uh, it worked and matched up. Some of it was older, um, where the imagery that we are using was actually newer. So there was a really good conversation to help them understand what this data could do, what it meant, what it was. Um, what we have seen since the data was completed, it was officially released last December, um, almost a year ago now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with local governments where they're starting to understand what they can use the data for. Um, so uh, conversations with Fauquier County in Virginia, they're really interested in using the tree canopy data set to update their comprehensive plan and zoning to be able to understand where they have tree canopy and where they want to maintain it. Um, stuff like that is really cool to, to have this level of detail that especially a lot of rural counties never really would have had the chance to have before um, or never thought it was within their reach. Going into some of the uses for it um, and some of the other data sets that we're combining it, and this is, uh, goes along the lines of the importance of LiDAR data um, that we were talking about a little bit a while ago. Um, having LiDAR data is really critical because um, what you can do is match the resolution of the land cover, you know, that, that really fine scale land cover data with a really fine scale of understanding of elevation throughout the watershed. And what we're interested in is identifying particular areas where conservation or restoration would provide uh, significant benefits coming out of this. So what we can do is take things like, you know, the previous stream center line data, which is great, um, but it may only shows kind of where that is, and use that LIDAR to map how surface flow uh, is coming across the landscape. So you can begin to understand if you were to do a retention pond, if you were to look at a variable width riparian buffer, um, where some of that information may, uh, or where some of that, those projects may provide additional benefits. Or if the farmer only wants to do a small project on their land, 
how do you start to identify where that could be best located to provide the maximum benefits to be able to understand that. Um, again, this is dependent on the, li the data you have, the age of the LIDAR, in some cases it's older. Um, but what we've seen is by you know, taking this out to landowners, this matches up with their knowledge of where the parts of their farm that are a little bit wetter, um, where are the parts of the farm that may not be as productive. And what it's helping to do is quantify and put some numbers behind that. So you can use it in modeling, you can use it in uh, different tools. As an example of one of the larger projects that we've done, um, we have an initiative called Envision the Susquehanna, um, where it's a community-based conservation planning framework for the Susquehanna River watershed. We've done a lot of community surveys, try to understand what local partners are working on, what they're doing, and to identify um, areas that we can collaborate. So for two counties, Clinton and Center County up in Pennsylvania, we work with uh, the Clearwater Conservancy, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, um, with a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to be able to prioritize and identify all of essentially the plantable areas along areas of concentrated flow. So initially it started out as we were remapping stream channels um, with a high degree of accuracy. And what we found is we wanted to identify areas that were draining at least 25 acres. And in some of these more flat farmed areas, you don't have an actual stream channel, but you do have an area of concentrated flow. Um, what we're able to do is combine that high resolution land cover data with that high resolution flow data to be able to understand where you don't have trees, wetlands, or shrubs to identify where you could plant trees. Um, and what we found was we identified about 43,883 gaps um, in these two counties. And then we were able to use a series of data layers, both in terms of regional habitat data sets provided by the North Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative, looking at attributes like meander, you know, how sinuous is the stream, looking at the drainage area coming down with that information to that gap, to be able to understand, uh, you know, the, the relative benefits of that project to habitat, to water quality, um, to other aspects of it, and rank those 43,883 gaps from 1 to 43,883, um, and work with local partners to be able to implement high-ranking projects, including the number one ranked project um, throughout those two counties is now going in the ground this fall, which is pretty cool to be able to see that. Uh, we're also able to build some more public-facing tools. So we launched a website for these two counties called restorationreports.com, where anyone can go in, type in their address, and get some really useful information about their property in terms of delineating how much restorable area do they have on their property, what's the drainage area coming through that, um, and linking them based on their interests in agricultural production, recreation, or wildlife to a set of information about the benefits of that restoration for their focal area. We also worked with about eight uh, restoration professionals throughout those two counties to identify the types of projects that they would like to be notified about. And on each of these reports, we have contact information to say, if you want to do a restoration project on your property for these things, here's who you call. And have a little checkbox saying, please contact me. So we can provide those numbers to the restoration the professionals. And in about the month that we've had this launched, um, we've had about 150 people request to be contacted about this information. Um, so it's really cool to actually see private citizens reaching out to say, I want to do something on my property. Um, we currently have funding proposals in to expand this to about 15 other counties in Pennsylvania. Um, so hopefully over the next six months, we'll be able to do this additional work and be able to expand this throughout the area. From a more local government standpoint of how uh, we're seeing some of this being used as well, uh, we're working with the York County Stormwater Consortium, um, who's using Bay Program funding through the state to the county that was originally going to 44 municipalities. They decided to combine their efforts. Um, we created a web-based platform that allows those municipalities to quickly go in, draw the footprint of their proposed project, and what it will do is calculate both the drainage area coming to that project as well as the land cover in the treatment area as well as the um, project area, and uh, feed that information into the BayFast model to be able to calculate relative reductions for that project. Um, then with the proposal going in, the county can very quickly assess uh, kind of a cost benefit for given projects coming in. They're now using this, um, they use it the last grant cycle, it's been very effective, and we're now talking with them about expanding to include some other information as well as talking with Lancaster County across the Susquehanna River about potentially adapting this to that county as well. 
So 15 minutes is very quick. Um, we have a report for each one of those coming up. But with that, thank you very much. Just a quick sampling of the data, uh, what it looks like, and some of the things that we're using.